A good place to start is removal of the sway bar. In order to remove the sway bar, we're going to first remove the links at both ends and then the mounting brackets to the chassis. To remove the link, we take the nut off the top, pull the link assembly away. Next, we'll take a wrench, remove the mounting bracket from the frame on both sides. Before final removal of the last mounting bolt to the frame, support the sway bar so it doesn't fall. With the mounting brackets disconnected, we simply remove the sway bar. Next, we're going to remove the entire tie rod assembly. To do that, we have to first remove the cotter pins from the inner and outer nut, and at this time also, remove the cotter pins from the lower and upper ball joint to facilitate their removal later. Next, we remove the nuts, and by using our ball joint fork and a hammer, we will remove the tie rod assembly from the vehicle. This is our entire tie rod assembly. Do not discard it because we're going to want to measure it out to preset our new assembly for proper tow. Next, we're going to remove the brake caliper. To do this, we're going to remove the upper and lower attaching bolts, pull it away from the rotor, and then with a heavy piece of wire, we're going to hang it anywhere within the wheel well to the back of the wheel well to keep it out of our way and also to keep the weight of the caliper off of the flexible line to keep from damaging it. Next, we want to remove the shock absorber. We've already taken the nut off the top of the shock absorber. Now, we have to remove the two lower attaching bolts and pull the, the shock absorber down through the lower control arm to complete removal. Now, we want to loosen the front and rear lower control arm mounting bolts a few turns so that when we go to remove our spring, the control arm will swing away freely out of our way. We also want to loosen the upper and lower ball joint nuts one turn, after which we take a large hammer and strike the spindle here and here until the ball joints pop loose. Now it's time to install our spring compressor. To do that, we have to install it up through the lower control arm, position it in the spring, and properly engage the spring with these hooked feet.
the spring compressor is properly mounted in the spring when the top end of the compressor is as close to the top of the spring as possible and the bottom of the compressor is located as close to the bottom of the spring as possible. Always be very careful to properly locate the spring within the compressor fingers. Now it's time to use a coil spring compressor to compress the coil spring. To do that, we're going to use a ratchet and socket assembly through the lower control arm, tightening the compressor only until the spring becomes loose in its confines and no more. Never compress the spring more than absolutely necessary to do the job. Next, we're going to position a floor jack from the opposite side of the car, underneath the lower control arm, and raise the control arm up approximately one quarter of an inch. Now we can safely remove the nuts from the upper and lower ball joint and remove the entire spindle assembly from the vehicle. After which, we're going to slowly lower the jack, allowing the lower control arm to swing down slowly, allowing us to remove the coil spring. Once the spring is out, you always want to make sure, once again, that the ends of the springs are not facing towards you or anyone else. If the spring compressor were to break, if it's facing towards you, you have a good, very good chance of getting hurt. Before unloading the spring, we first want to mark the location of the compressor for reinstallation purposes and also the compressed length of the spring to facilitate reinstallation. We need to take our grease pencil and mark on the spring the location of all the fingers of the compressor. We want to reinstall the compressor in the spring in the exact location so we don't have an interference problem during reinstallation. We also want to measure the compressed length of the spring which in this spring we have 13 and a quarter inches. And then for that side of the vehicle, we're going to record that length on the memory tape so that the spring will go back into the vehicle easily. To remove the lower control arm, simply remove the two attaching bolts. To remove the upper control arm, we must remove both attaching nuts, the shims, and then remove the studs themselves on the driver's side because the steering shaft is in our way from removing the control arm. Usually on the passenger side, it is not necessary to loosen or remove the studs. When we first loosen the nuts, the shim packs will become loose. We want to remove these shim packs in their entirety from the rear and the front and attach them in the corresponding location on our memory tape so that they can be reinstalled in the original location to aid us in establishing proper pre-alignment.
with the nuts backed off to the end of the stud to protect the end of the stud, but at the point where you can move them with your fingers, you only have to take a hammer or a bar and striking the end of the nut, push the stud in through the mount. Now, by removing the nut, we can remove the control arm. This is our upper control arm. During reassembly, once the control arm is located back in its proper position, we're going to lift up on the control arm to expose the head of the studs. Using a punch and a hammer, drive the stud back into position into the mount to engage a spline so we can reinstall the control arm mounting nuts. With removal of the bump stop, chassis disassembly is completed. On this application, we need to just twist it to break it loose and then draw it out of the hole of the chassis. Some stops may have a stud through the bottom held in by a nut. The nut must be removed to facilitate removal of the bump stop. 